Great. Thank you, Craig. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so, yes, as Craig mentioned, I um, do know a number of you in the room. Um, uh, Ag Communicators has been in business now for about five years. Uh, it's a business that I started with my completely awesome business partner, Belinda Kay, who many of you would know. Um, we have a team of 17 um, people, um, mostly based in South Australia, and Alastair Lawson is here today. He's probably done a story with half of you in the room. Um, and I'd just like, to, um, I'd just like to acknowledge the team because without their continued support and commitment, it means that I can't come up here and talk about the things which I love most. And um, building trust in our completely awesome grains industry is, is one of them. So I should also mention that um, I farm uh, with my husband about an hour east of Adelaide. And um, when Craig was talking about the season that was or was not, ours was definitely one that was not. Onwards and upwards, though. So um, trust, well, hasn't it just become the issue of our times? I mean, when you consider all the issues um, that industries are facing with the at the moment with trust, um, I mean, you think about finance and banking. We've had the, um, the findings of the Royal Commission out last week, and it's been interesting to observe the big four and how they've um, responded to those findings. Uh, we've also had the traditional church, you know, cases of, of child abuse that happened 40 or 50 years ago are now being brought to light, and there are significant trust issues in the traditional church. Um, schools and community organisations, and it would seem even cricket these days, um, we're not too sure about our trust in them. Um, I've also got a, um, a cover of a magazine there called The Company Director from the AICD. So the issue of trust is being considered at you know, board level, corporate, gov uh, corporate level, right around Australia at the moment. And it would seem that we even have expectations of how to act once trust is broken. And even you know, last week when you, um, you, know, you saw NAB's response, or lack thereof, to the Banking Royal Commission um, and you know, how that ended for their chair and CEO um, stepping down. But I really love this quote from the CEO of Roy Morgan Australia, um, and she's just captured it brilliantly when it, it talks about trust. That trust requires a leadership to embrace and exhibit ethics, not just to plan how to behave, but to believe it and deeply. So just for the next 20 minutes, I just want to talk to you about um, my Churchill Fellowship findings, because that is the, the platform um, that I've been able to, to do as many presentations on this issue as I have. I also want to talk through social licence, trust and freedom to operate and the, um, the connections between the three of those. Um, I also want to talk about what building trust looks like, because trust is quite different to defending an interest. And also I've come up with some key messages for this audience and also some actions that are that are happening nationally. So, background, Churchill Fellowship. So, um, in 2017, I was fortunate enough to travel to the US, UK and Canada. Um, I met with 47, 47 different organisations and I had hundreds of hours of talk time uh, to compile. Some of those, those organisations would be familiar to you, such as the American Farm Bureau Federation, uh, the National Farmers Union, the Centre for Food Integrity in the US. Um, and from all of that um, study um, and all of that, um, I guess, you know, analysis of what they were doing, uh, I was able to compile a report which was um, released um, a year ago um, uh, with five recommendations. And I'm just going to take a time out there to um, plug my sponsor for today. Um, the Churchill Trust does have a lot of great opportunities and their applications for fellowships are actually open right now. So if you perhaps you know, don't fit the criteria for a Nuffield, I would strongly encourage you to look at a Churchill Fellowship because it is a really great opportunity. It's across all industries um, and we've even had some of our own gone through. Um, Alan Mayfield has done a Churchill Fellowship um, in years gone by. So my first recommendation was around awareness of the need to build trust. So as a, as a general observation, the farmers in the US and Canada and even the organisations that represent them had a, a, a deeper understanding of the need to build trust and particularly the risks to their industry for not um, uh, building trust. And so since I've been back, I've been looking for examples in our own industry about you know, how we're communicating with, with farmers and you know, the likes of yourselves in this audience about how we're, um, you know, the importance of this need to build trust. And I came across this really great um, example in the meat industry strategic plan in Australia. And it highlights that there is a $4 billion downside risk if we lose consumer and community support. So that is huge, and that's just one industry. 
But what is interesting to note is this upside opportunity here is not very big. So to me, that says we have absolutely no choice but to get this right. It is so important for us to be able to continue to do what we're doing now. We've got to have consumer and community support. So, of course, this is only for the meat industry. So, you consider grains at, at the moment, you know, in South Australia, we've got issues with GM. Um, nationally, we've got um, issues with ag chemical use, with glyphosate. Um, you know, the wool industry's got its own issues, eggs, chickens, and so on. So, when you consider that collectively, it is a very big economic risk to our industry, and we have to get this right. Recommendation two was that uh, there just are more organisations building trust in the US and Canada. Um, a lot of their um, efforts were characterised by a cross-commodity approach. So people out there in the Australian community don't necessarily think of grain farmers are doing the right thing, but you know, you've got to watch those beef farmers or sheep farmers. Collectively, they think of farmers as farmers. The third recommendation was around the need to develop a national approach to guide efforts. Um, and I've just got there that we need a national strategy and steering committee which defines how the food system will engage in building trust, uh, in trust building activities and how can we learn lessons from each other in what strategies are most successful. So um, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for them, the Canadians are all over this. So this is their, um, their trust building model here. Um, in the middle is their desire to build public trust um, they have a steering committee which focuses on governance and guidance um, of what public trust and, and building trust looks like uh, in their community. The um, Centre for Food Integrity is all about the research and the training, and so they're looking at, you know, well, how do we build trust? What are, does the community actually want to know about us? How do we engage with them? Um, the, the section around here is their value chain roundtables. So they have a roundtable for each commodity, and it's from the farmer through to the end user, and they meet regularly and talk about whatever the issues are that are facing their commodity. And one of those issues is trust. And then all around the outside here are what they call the amplifiers. So um, the ones up the top here, farm and food care, is one of the large ones in Canada. And so um, it is one of those national cross-commodity approaches. Um, and then all around here, um, they've got a number of state or provincial um, activities. And so they're all, they're all talking together, they're all working together, trying to um, you know, tackle a common, a common issue. Our recommendation four was around the development of industry spokespeople. So Australia needs a national network of well-trained, prepared um, producers across all ag commodities to know how to tell their story in a way that engages non-ag audiences and builds trust beyond our own echo chamber. And so I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. And final recommendation about the funding matching the industry risk. So um, we've just seen an example of the meat industry of what the risk looks like to them. So that the action to build trust must be aligned in the budget of every organisation that has a, a, a financial stake in the continued profitability of the industry. And I'm not just talking about GRDC, I'm talking right from farm level, um, local, state, through to national organisations. So, trust, social licence and freedom to operate, how do they um, all can connect together? So, just so we're all on the same page, when we talk about social licence, we're talking about the privilege of operating with minimal formalised restrictions, either regulation, legislation or market-based mandates, based on maintaining public trust by doing what is right. And so, this is a, um, a model from the US Centre for Food Integrity, and in this section, I'll be drawing on quite a lot of their research because they are the, um, I guess, the world leaders in this space. And their trust building model here clearly demonstrates that our freedom to operate depends on our social license, which depends on trust. So public trust enables social license. Um, there are three factors which influence an individual's level of trust. And so now we're talking about this right, uh, left-hand part for you of the, um, of the diagram here. So the first is influential others, so meaning the opinions of those in two circles, so that can be family, um, friends, social circles. Um, it could also be credentialed others, such as doctors, dietitians, and veterinarians. And so we know these days, um, you know, people aren't just getting their news from, uh, are not just getting their information from science, they're getting their information across a number of, a number of platforms. 
Um, the second factor is competence, which relates to science and technical capacity. And the third is confidence or shared values. So just to pick up on that concept of shared values, the CFI research has found that shared values are three to five times more important to building trust than sharing facts or demonstrating technical skills or expertise. So how we might have previously done it um, in our industry, and in many respects still do, people have questions, so we go and do some, some research and we give them some science and some data. And so if they inevitably don't understand, then we go and do some more research, um, do some, get some more science, get some more data, and we give it to them. And then when they still don't understand, we go and do some more research, get some more science, get some more data, and give it to them. And so this cycle is repeating, um, and we're not really engaging about values. And so before when I was um, saying that, you know, people's, um, you know, where they source information is changing, I mean, 50% of people in the US are getting their information from Facebook only. So this is what we're up against. The stats are not that different in Australia. Um, when it comes to provision of information, science first is not opening the door for us. So historically, we might have said, well, research proves that it's okay to do this. Research says that we can farm in this particular way, we can care for our animals in this particular way. We have certainly said that we can be more productive and even more profitable by doing this. Um, but what the shared values approach um, is requesting or requiring of us, that the best way is just to establish that shared value first and open the door, establish a relationship, and then talk about science. And I know for you know, many of the agronomists in the room who are working one-on-one -on -one with farmers, I know that you know that that is true. So a statement of how that looks is you know, nutrition as is important to us as it is to you. So let's talk about how we produce food in a manner that enables us to provide you with a nutritious food supply. So I've just compiled there some values of Australian agriculture and we, we really have a great story. Um, some of those listed there, you know, we've got, um, we're committed to protecting our land, pride in our quality produce, caring for our employees, contributing to our community, um, family heritage and generational small businesses. I mean, that, that's a real, you know, there's plenty of non-ag um, people in, um, in cities that could really relate to that. Keeping, forward healthy, uh, keeping food healthy and affordable, food safety, security, humane treatment of animals, which includes you know, feeding them the correct foods, and environmental sustainability. So I just want to give you an example, a real life example of what leading with shared values looks like and um, messages that resonate. So I've just got the, um, the Lamex logo up there because our communicators organised the Lamex conference in Perth last year. It is a sheep and lamb industry event and we were in the home of live export. So as you can imagine, we were planning for protests and all sorts. Anyway, it all, it all went fine, but I get on the plane and I've you know, been in a rush and I've got a jacket that says Lamex on the back. And so I sit down next to the sort of middle-aged man next to me, Finn, um, he's a helicopter pilot, so he's not, you know, he's done some study. Um, and he wants to have a conversation with me about how we kill baby lambs and eat them. And so I just thought, you know, when you get that moment and you're like, three hours, three hours of this, I could see what the plane ride was going to be like. Um, he just had a, a, a deeply held value that we shouldn't be doing, we, we shouldn't be treating animals in this particular way. So I, I don't share that value and we just agree to disagree. But then the next thing he said was, and you farmers, you have cut down all the trees, you've denuded the landscape. If we had more trees, it would rain more. It's true. And so um, uh, once he said that, he also was particularly concerned about the soil. And he said, well, you know, if um, you know, the soil is the lifeblood of the planet, we've got to be doing more to care about it. So, in that kind of conversation, I could see that he had a, a value around environmental sustainability, and I thought, bingo, I'm in. And so I began to talk to him about how we care for soils on our, you know, in our industry, on our farm. And so I was talking about no-till farming, that we can cut this really thin slice in the soil and just drop the seed and fertiliser in there together. And, um, you know, when we harvest our crop, we can, you know, spread the stubble everywhere and it creates like a, a mulch effect and it conserves soil moisture. He was amazed. He said, well, how long have you been doing this for? 20, 30 years? And so often it's not, you know, the, the big issues of the now. There's a whole group of, you know, things that they just don't even know about us that's standard practice that we can be talking about. 
And the other thing when it comes to messages that resonate, um, a lot of the time, you know, mes messages that resonate with us as an industry don't necessarily resonate with those outside the industry. And a good example of that was um, I was speaking with CropLife Canada um, when I was over there in 2017. And they were talking about the messaging work that they had done. So sadly, the, um, you know, the message around, you know, we should be able to use um, ag chemicals because, you know, it helps us grow more crops which can help feed the world. That is not a message that resonates. And yes, it is sad, but it is true. But when you look at the message, um, the message that because we're able to, you know, use herbicides and pesticides in our crops, that can save you four and a half thousand dollars on your grocery bill every year, that is a message that resonates. So we've got to be thinking about the messages that we use in our industry are not necessarily the messages that resonate outside of our industry. So what does building trust look like? And again, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for them, the Canadians are all over it. So this is their trust framework. Um, they call it like a house because it's kind of got a foundation, columns and a roof. Their um, foundation is continuous improvement and transparency. So what that means is they want to be farming in a way where they are demonstrating they are continuously improving. And they also want to farm in a way um, where they can demonstrate that they're being transparent about their practices. There are three, three columns here. The first one is doing the right thing. So when I mentioned before that Canada has these value chain roundtables and they discuss issues in their industry, they also discuss what doing the right thing actually looks like. And so I said to them, well, you know, you've got all these different players around the table. How can you actually agree on what doing the right thing looks like? And they said, well, you know, when everyone is around the table and they're there for the right reasons, it's amazing how the discussion aligns, how doing the right thing, they can all agree on what that looks like. The second part is around a trusted assurance and verification system. So once you say, you know, this is what we've agreed is the right thing to do, how are you actually measuring it? And so they use their verification system for that. And then finally, communication. So once, once you've identified the right thing to do, you're measuring it, how are you communicating it? How are you telling people outside of your industry that this is what you're doing? And then um, the roof here, they, they call their hub. And so that's where it comes back to that national approach, um, making sure that they're all learning from each other and that you know, what's not working in one industry, another industry can learn from. So it's really interesting in Australia, obviously, you know, we, we've got a few issues um, uh, and I've tried to, I guess, in the next couple of slides um, and since I've been back from, the, um, from the, the trip, just try to sort of explain um, a few different concepts to, I guess, eliminate some of the confusion. So obviously, um, uh, this is a standard bell curve, but, you know, in any, um, in any issue, there's, you know, people that are pro. So, you know, this is, this is us at one, end, at one end, we've got, you know, farmers, the ag industry generally. We spend a lot of time um, worrying about what the activists are saying or doing, but the, I guess the, the race is on for this large group of what is called the movable middle. So what does you know, your average Australian think about some of these things? And so I know a lot of people are, are wondering whether you know, through our efforts and through you know, activism efforts, is that group of people leaning that way or is that group of people leaning that way? Um, it is the reality of what we're facing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not a, um, in, in terms of all the activity that's happening, it's not an either or approach. Every approach is valid, which is um, where I get to in this slide. I just found it really useful to sort of outline a spectrum of activity because I've had a lot of people, um, when I've done, you know, a few presentations talk about, you know, we need to build trust, we just need to do an advertising campaign, we just need to, you know, get out there and tell them, you know, why it is that we do what we do or, you know, they'll all be, they'll all be grateful for us, you know, when there's no food left. So just plotting it out on a, on a bit of a spectrum is helpful. So at the one end, we have the defending an industry or a practice, you know, defending our, our you know, access to ag chemicals, which um, in some respects is uh, um, reactionary and can be about educating. In the middle, we've got outreach and awareness programs. And on the other end, we've got building trust. So um, defending an interest or a practice here looks like developing and leveraging relationships to communicate why farmers must be allowed to farm in a particular way. So that's you know, lobbying on behalf of members, advocating to politicians, and that's, that's what members expect of their advocacy organisations. They expect for them to be going in and lobbying hard on their behalf to protect the rights that we have as farmers. 
Um, outreach and awareness, so communication of positive ag messages or providing positive ag experiences. So there's a lot of that work happening in Australia. It could be on social media, um, you know, training farmers to engage, a whole different um, uh, suite of, of projects. Um, you know, MLA is a really good example. It's got these virtual reality goggles that they're taking around to food festivals and giving people an experience of what it's actually like to be on a sheep or cattle property. And then finally, building trust. Um, it's a commitment to food and fibre involving a production, involving transparency and sustainability, um, engaging with consumers and the broader community to become aligned with their values, um, doing the right thing, measuring it and communicating it, underpinned by transparency and continual improvement. So it is more of a posture that says, look, I understand that you have questions about how we're producing your food, and I'm going to do my best to answer them. So what can you do to help build trust? So first, first key message here, building trust is about doing the right thing. And so when our industry says that we care about doing the right thing, you, you know, as agronomists, resellers, extension officers, um, your role, you're on the front line in encouraging it to be done. And so um, it's really important because, you know, when our advocacy groups, you know, when GPSA and Grain Growers and Grain Producers Australia, when they are going into bat for us and, you know, making claims that, you know, we're using chemical in the right way, you know, looking after our environment, etc. Um, we have to be able to back that up in every paddock, in every spray application, you know, on every truck that we're sending livestock off farm, whatever it might be, we've got to be able to back it up. And so you are all in a really good position in this room to be encouraging that to be done. Secondly, we have to lead with shared values. So we have to get used to, uh, to communicating in a landscape of emotion and confusion on whose science is right. Obviously, you know, um, our, our um, perspective of our science is that our science is right, but to your average um, person in the Australian community, they're getting science from all angles. They don't know whose science is right. So we've got to get used to leading with values to open the door to communicating our message. And, you know, when, when you think about it, um, there's plenty of research that shows that our brains are hardwired for story, and the more emotion in the story, the more it clicks. And so, um, you know, our brains aren't necessarily hardwired for science, with the um, exception of everyone in this room, of course. Um, our brains aren't hardwired for science, and I think that's reflective in, you know, we've got a lot of issues in getting kids into STEM in schools these days. So we've got to remember, we can't take the emotion out of the debate necessarily, because it's how we are pre-wired to get information. Um, we have to be prepared that, you know, we might be asked to change. Um, I've just got here that to succeed in building trust, we have to acknowledge that there might be behaviour in our farming community that is inconsistent with doing the right thing and inconsistent with our shared values. So we might need to talk about it and we might need to be prepared to change. So I'm not saying that we, you know, are going to hang people out to dry for not doing the right thing. But certainly, you know, everyone's got a phone, everyone is able to publish um, video, photos these days. You know, the era of the rogue operator or the she'll be right mate, it, it just has, it has to finish because we need to be backing up that we are doing the right thing. And key message four, it's going to take your time, your effort and maybe even your dollars. Um, we need strong leadership so that what we say we value is actually being reflected in our on-farm actions. Our behaviours must match our actions and beliefs. And so um, we just can't leave it up to a few organisations. We all have a role to play. I've got some paleo cousins that I'm working on. And if you're not familiar with the paleo diet, that is an anti-grains diet. So I've got some work ahead of me. Um, there are no silver bullets. It really, um, it is an all, everyone, every shoulder to the wheel, um, so to speak. So just want to finish up um, really briefly by talking about what is actually happening in Australia, because there is a lot of really good work being done. Um, I'm chairing a steering committee for the National Farmers Federation about building trust, particularly in a cross-commodity approach. Um, they had a meeting in August last year with all of their members and, you know, we asked for, you know, people to put their hands up as to who was interested in taking this forward. Um, there was a coalition of the willing, um, I guess, put together and we're starting to have that conversation around um, what we're going to do and we've decided that we will be looking at um, a single issue approach around chemical use. Um, there is a joint RDC community trust program looking at research and GRDC is, is one, of, one of the um, 
contributors to that program. So how can we better understand our community? Um, what do we know about them that will help them to build trust? And then how can we provide that to, um, to you know, agronomists, um, farmers, etc.? Um, there are individual RDC projects for their commodities. So I mentioned before about um, you know, MLA with its virtual goggles. The dairy industry is doing um, their legendary program. Um, so there's a lot of good work happening there. And there's also some emerging state-based projects that are, um, that are starting, to, um, starting to get some traction. Um, even in WA, as well, well, even on Monday, I was talking to them about how they're looking to gear up some of their work over there. So there's a lot of great stuff happening in Australia. But we can't just um, assume that you know a few big organisations are going to uh, look after it for us. Um, so if I could you know have my pick of, of any anything, I'd really um, love for us to address the gap in Australia at the moment for an independent and credible source to be providing unbiased information to the Australian community. I think we do need someone that could speak about us um, rather than ourselves um, speaking for us. So. Um, I mean, I, I really do like the Canadian model. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of good things there. So, um, so I might leave it there. Thank you, Craig, and thank you to GRDC and ORM for the invitation today. Um, it is a, a subject that I'm very deeply passionate about. Um, I would just say, though, if you know, usually when I, I talk about this um, topic, there's usually a few people in the room that are like, "Yes, we really need to get onto this," and you know it resonates with them. So if this has resonated with you, I would love to hear from you. I'd really love to start developing a network in South Australia where we can start thinking about how we might engage about some of this kind of stuff. So thank you.